Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the prospective PhD students. Good evening and uh, or good morning, depending on where you are, I guess could be good afternoon too. Um, let me share my screen first. Can you see? No? Ah, can you see the screen now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great, so I have very short time to um, share with you some my work in, in my department. I changed the uh, title a little bit to Demographic Challenges, Human Development and Social Inequality. Um, you've been listening to all different disciplines the whole day. And uh, I, I think I'm the only one that's coming from sociology. So a little uh, general, uh, broad introduction to sociology is what we do is a systematic study of a wide variety of ways that human life is organized and how our behavior and attitudes are influenced by these large forces, which we call structure, institution, history, or culture, uh, and vice versa. Um, sociology provides you with a large ranges of tools and perspectives to see and understand how our society functions. Uh, look at the, the dynamic of social changes, the causes and consequences of these social processes. We use various data and research methods, archival statistics, surveys, ethnographic studies, historical comparative methods, and so on. Um, all our studies are empirically based and logic audited. We're interested in just about everything under the sun, I would say, a wide range of them. It could be religion, health, market, work, race, gender, social mobility, globalization process, family, children, and youth. So a large range of things. Um, as of my own work that I will share tonight, um, I am a demographer and a sociology in social stratification and family studies. So my work mostly focused on three big categories that are of global concerns, demographic challenges around the world, human development and social inequality. These are generally include the declined fertility and marriage rate, shrinking working age population, aging population, rising divorce, change of family patterns, and human development across life course. So I'm interested in both in young children, uh, uh, young youth and young adults, as well as older folks in their well-being. I'm also interested in social inequality, meaning that different groups, subgroups in the societies, how they fare in these well-beings. In the past, I've been studying uh, all these topics in the United States. Since 2008, I came to NUS. I've been focusing on Asia and more recently in local uh, situation in Singapore. So in the category of, I'm gonna go through this very quickly and just give you, you a little bit of example of what we do in sociology, what I do uh, with my colleagues in NUS. In the demographic challenges that affected families, we've looked at uh, families in East, different regions in uh, um, Asia. So Southeast Asia, as well as South Asia. We've looked at population and uh, family changes in Singapore as a unique case study in global family change. We've looked at the gender roles of mothers and fathers. We've looked at different patterns, changes on different types of families, like single parent families, step families, and different family structures, including those who only have one person living in the household. Um, just a bit on the changing marriage patterns in Asia. Historically, Asia is characterized by near universal marriages. Uh, five decades ago or six decades ago, um, almost everyone gets married by the age of 35. And in fact, this remains the case in some parts of Asia, like in South Asia. The age of marriage in there remains still quite low. 
Uh, child marriages before 14 is, even though it's in decline, still have a portion that is, uh, such as in Bang Bangladesh, they still have 18 to 20% of uh, uh, marriages that, are, that happens before age 14. On the other extreme, there's countries such as Singapore, Koreans, um, uh, that have very late marriages. So one thing that uh, you should take away is that Asia is very heterogeneous. It's dangerous to just say Asian countries because they are really quite different. Um, I looked at these patterns, countries in East Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asian countries. And as you can see, the mean age at first marriage has been rising in all three regions, but at different levels. At East Asia, the age now has become about age 30, except for China, that's still a bit low. Um, in South Asia, as I mentioned, several countries like Bangladesh uh, uh, and uh, India, they're still, the mean age of marriage is still below 20. And Southeast Asia kind of fall in the middle with the red line being uh, Singapore uh, that is at the latest age of marriage. But a lot of countries like Indonesia, Cambodia and Laos, they're still with uh, um, almost near universal marriage and uh, under age uh, and uh, around about 20 of age. So you see this very extended singlehood happening in some countries like Singapore, Thailand, Myanmar, and Brunei, where about one in four or one in five of females that still remain single at the age of 30 to 34. On the other extreme, countries like Sri Lanka and other Southeast Asian countries, you still only have about 5% of them remain single. So uh, trying, we try to explain this uh, changes with economic growth and educational expansion but there's also much more complex reasons for cultural traditions, norms, and so on that uh, explains the uh, difference between, um, explain the, the different patterns in countries. So here we chart the uh, singlehood rate of, in female by GDP per capita and by percent female gross tertiary education. You can see that the so-called modernization you know, the, the, the richer a country is, the more highly educated women are, the, the uh, higher the singlehood. They do explain quite a bit, but not all. There's still a fair amount of uh, variations that are not explained by these marginalization forces. Um, so we spend a lot of time trying to work on this, but I don't have time to go into details now. When you look at fertility rate in these three regions, you see the similar patterns as well. While the East Asian countries now are going um, are around one with the total fertility rate and some even lower than one with uh, Korea and uh, Singapore is uh, quite low as well. This is not quite updated, this is 10 years ago already. So some of the countries are going even further down. But South Asian countries are still some of them, Afghanistan and Bangladesh um, uh, and um, Pakistan still uh, quite a high total fertility um, rate, even though compared to uh, decades ago, they're much lower now. So again, we look at uh, closer to home, Singapore situation, you see the same thing. Uh, the, um, there's a large, proportion of women that remain uh, childless. That means they don't have babies anymore. Um, you can see that the rate uh, increased rapidly uh, for, from 3.2 for those who were born before 1925 to those uh, to 23 percent for those who were uh, born in 1966 to 70s. By this time they were 45 and 50 already and this is if you put it in a global scene, a global picture, uh, with some of the highest uh, rate of childlessness um, uh, around the world, Singapore rate is quite high. It's almost the top uh, there, and you can see the rate is very, uh, the the rate of increase is quite rapid. 
So we spend a lot of time talking about marriage and fertility. As a result of these declining rates, one of the consequences is the aging of the population around the world. And, and Asia is not uh, different either. So we talked about the challenges in uh, taking up uh, elderly care. How do we deal with long-term care for ASEAN countries plus three? How do we look at uh, elderly care issues in these different countries? And, and how are the care responsibilities shifting from family gradually to community-based and also uh, government-based care uh, gradually? We look at inequalities between older adults too. We looked at a new concept called productive aging in Asia that I would talked about a little bit. We looked at how the age um, people retire and how that affect human capital uh, uh, in different countries, including Asia uh, and, and Korea. So you can see that throughout Asia, we don't just look at Singapore, we look at all different countries and we compare them and, uh, and situate them in a global context too. Um, you probably all know that the global aging trend is happening very fast now. And with the fastest growing group is the oldest old, those who are 80 and above. And Asia is the same, but there's some unique aspect of uh, aging experience in Asia. First, it happens a lot faster. And secondly, it involves a lot more people than in other places in Western society. And then many of the Asian societies have uh, much, le uh, much less developed. They have more diverse demographic landscapes and cultural values um, and expectations. There are different religious groups, racial groups here. And also Asian countries have a, a different kind of welfare regime, not as developed and or, or as generous as in Western countries. Many of the countries rely on families to take care of the elderly population. So what used to take a century or even two centuries in the West to for a, a Western country to age, in Asia, many of these countries takes about 20 years or less. Um, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore take less than 20 years to get into an aging society or super age society. Um, Asian population is 60% of the world population. As you can see that many of the large countries are in Asia. And therefore, when we talked about aging population in the next few decades, you can see that the increase of the aging population are mostly happening in Asian countries. The orange area that uh, I, I'm showing you was 60 and above, and also for the oldest old that requires most of the long-term care. And so aging issue is important to study in Asia. Um, Japan is of course the, the oldest country in Asia, but Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan are also coming up quickly, as well as Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar in the next few decades, um, it's going to come up very quickly. And they don't have as much resources to handle, to take care of an aging population as much. So I mentioned the concept of uh, productive aging. And this is some new theme that we have been studying in, in recent years. And the idea is that it's a becoming quite a popular developmental strategy to view older adults as assets that can benefit the society with their longer healthy life expectancy and rich human capital, as opposed to looking at them as a burden to the society. So seeing older adults as someone who can contribute to the society. So this productive aging concept uh, differ from the successful aging and active aging in the sense that it emphasizes continuous contribution to the family and social integration of older adults to the society. So we've done a lot of studies. We've edited a special volume and one of the results, and I only have time to share you with you a little bit, 
is that volunteering overwhelmingly have a positive impact on cognitive uh, uh, well-being and uh, uh, mental health of older adults. So in all countries, Taiwan, Korean, Hong Kong, Japan, and so on, you see the similar kind of results that um, you know, volunteering continue to contribute is good for the society and good for themselves too. So these are some images of older adults uh, volunteering to help out in, uh, in the daycare center. So with all these demographic challenges and changes, one thing that's happening is average household size has decreased and in some uh, societies much faster than others. We've also been studying lately about uh, going solo, one person household. This one is about China, where we uh, documented in um, different OECD countries, uh, the percentage of household that only had one person live in there. So you can see that the blue col colors are Western OECD countries. Uh, many of them are uh, more than one third of the household that were already, uh, are, has only one person. The red bars are Asian countries with Japan, the highest about 30% and uh, Korea 25% and Taiwan also uh, more than 20%. China and Singapore are here, about 15% and 13%, and not very high yet compared to these others, but the rate would grow very, very quickly. So this particular paper look at uh, China and how it over time has increased with the one person household. In 2010, it has about 60 million of uh, a household that are only has one person living there. Uh, we use a projection method called pro-famine to project how, what's gonna happen in the next several decades, three decades. And here we can see that one person household were increased from 14.5% in 2010 to about one in four households in 2050. And uh, by that time, 133 million of the population would have one person living there, and that's one in four. The biggest increase would be in urban area, male, and those oldest old population. We used a population pyramid, as I say, this is a projection to show that by uh, these living alone person by their marital status. And we see that uh, there will be a large increase of single and divorced people, the red and the blue one, uh, especially for the male uh, that uh, in the coming next, in the, in the coming few decades. Uh, we also see that these young people would have high education. A lot of them would have college degrees. And these results were picked up by the Economist uh, journal in 2015. They are featuring and quoting our result in both uh, young people and old people living in urban areas and, and living alone. It's also picked up by uh, Bloomberg News about how the di distribution of age groups and how this is uh, the aftermath of China's one child policy with the fertility going down and the skewed sex ratio, a lot of people are going to remain single. This is the same thing. Um, another part of my work is looking at youth's uh, human de development. And uh, most recently we have looked at young people's in uncertain labor market. And it's a collection of um, countries uh, in Europe and um, in, in United States, in, in North America and in Asia as well. Um, how this is Bloomberg News recently picked up on our work and also quoted our work on uh, looking at the implication of COVID-19 and how that would affect uh, youth labor market uh, and create a generation that uh, are having a very tough time um, in the economic, um, in the labor market. Um, they pointed out, uh, they quoted us for saying that uh, women would be harder hit and young people would be harder hit than, than others, other age groups. Finally, we also studied child development and this is focusing on young children about how poverty affects children, 
what kind, how do children bounce back in adverse uh, population uh, circumstances, left behind children in Asia and so on. Um, we've done uh, recently a Singapore Longitudinal Early Development Study in Singapore. And that idea is to looking at human development of Singapore uh, that uh, we hypothesis would uh, produce productive, healthy, physical and social well-being of the people and that that would uh, benefit the society and economy. So uh, we started looking at early childhood because early childhood is very important. It's a malleable uh, stage of life and it has a long lasting impact on later development. Um, so what we have done is uh, looking at about 5,000 children, zero to six, uh, that their health, social, psychological well-being and cognitive well-being and looking at the multiple contexts of family, preschool, community, and state, and see how those contexts affect the different domains of children's development. So last year, we've completed the first wave of this study with 5,000 uh, children across uh, all over Singapore um, with different representation of uh, nationally representative groups. We've tried to study how uh, different parents uh, family situation and parents' attitude and investment affect uh, young children's cognitive development. This is four to six year old. What we have found very briefly is that um, there are very large differences in the test scores for these four to six year old uh, by income, family income. For both numeracy test and verbal test, about 0.85 of a standard deviation difference. So that's quite substantial. A similar pattern for parents' education. We've also seen that there's a lot of inequality um, in different kind of uh, uh, children's, uh, parents' uh, expectation and investment uh, in children, such as uh, the, the, the high SES, families have a much more stimulating home environment and they have more activity shared with parents and they have better self-regulation uh, uh, than others. Um, those were with high, uh, parent with higher um, education also, um, children spent twice as much time on one day on, on um, watching TV and in media in both week on both weekday and a weekend day. They also spent um, much more time uh, reading with parents, uh, uh, almost more than two, twice as much time uh, reading with mother and father. So all these are different, um, um, the patterns that are creating inequalities starting from early childhood that could uh, increase the, uh, increase as children goes on. So I hope I've given you some very quick ideas of what we do. But as I say, my colleagues in sociology department uses different methodologies and, and they have a lot more to do. So I hope you will, uh, we will see you soon in uh, to join NUS uh, in sociology or other departments. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jean, for that really interesting talk. Um, and it covered a lot of ground that's uh, extremely relevant to, uh, I think, what we are experiencing right now. Um, I think at this point, um, it'll be, uh, we'll open up to some questions from the floor. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, um, raise your hand electronically or uh, type in the Q&A box. So I think just to get the ball rolling a bit, um, um, you mentioned, for example, that there were quite a bit of diverse interests in the sociology uh, department. Um, maybe you can touch a little bit of, about, you know, what kind of like, you know, what are you looking for in a, a student who is interested in doing a PhD in sociology? So like, how, you know, if they were interested in, in, in a PhD in sociology, you know, what, what should they be looking out to do in order to kind of, you know, be a successful applicant or a successful graduate student? Right. I, I think we're looking for people who are curious and interested in understanding social processes and how all these larger forces of uh, uh, society structure and institution affect how people behave and what their, they, uh, their attitude is like. 
And so any topic that it includes, you know, of, co of course, if you want, you work with me would be the topics that I've talked about on um, aging, uh, uh, demographic uh, topics and uh, children's uh, development, youth development, uh, but there are many others. I think mostly uh, we're looking for people who want rigorous training and uh, are interested in understanding how society works. So in, in addition to sort of, you know, naturally becoming an academic sociologist, um, um, you know, given sort of the broad range of uh, uh, topics that sociologists tend to study, what are some of the other kind of job prospects that uh, someone armed with a PhD in sociology could, could potentially kind of like uh, look into? Sociologists actually is in all kinds of, in many different kinds of field. Of course, the most traditional one is in academic, but many of our graduates uh, work in um, research institute uh, or companies outside, uh, think tank, uh, you know, research, um, also marketing firms. There's some of them work in marketing firms, uh, research institute of all kinds that focus on um, either, you know, cultural aspect or uh, as I say, more marketing and consumer type of aspect. But uh, where, where whichever field you go, I think sociologists give you the tools of thinking about how society works and a perspective of uh, thinking deeper about um, not, not just looking at the, the surface of uh, why are things like that, but deep, deep, deeper into some of the causes and the real reasons for uh, how things happen. Great, thanks. Uh, so there is a question that um, that came up. Um, are there any sort of um, you know collaborations with uh, the LKY School of Public Policy or sort of more specific involvements with the development of social policies, maybe in Singapore or in other countries? Uh, yeah, we have uh, here. We have a center for family and population uh, that has a large group of social uh, research associates. LKY is one group in particular that has many of the faculty members uh, participating in collaborating uh, with us or at least exchanging uh, with us. So they're, they are also interested in poverty issues, inequality issues, social integration issue, and certainly demographic issues of fertility and marriage and so on. We also collaborate with uh, social work department uh, psychology department, as you can hear that when I was talking about social development, human development, a lot of there's a lot of overlap uh, with um, with psychologists too. Uh, another group that we work with is uh, that had more overlap is media communication. Uh, you know the time uh, network. Uh, how, how people are using their network now uh, online, um, how children are spending time online. These are all with uh, media and communication. Another department is a geography where they, they're, they're, they do a lot of human geography movement, uh, on migration and gender type of issues. And of course, uh, there are some um, collaboration with economists as well, uh, as you know. Uh, so yeah, it's quite an interdisciplinary group. Um, PhDs, when they write dissertations, often have uh, faculty members from other departments, social work, psychology, as I mentioned, um, to co-supervise them. So um, that's quite um, th that's quite possible. We also have uh, some uh, overlap and collaboration with the ministries, the government here. Uh, uh, on, you know, we consult with them um, from time to time on population, uh, social support issues and children's development on youth development and social network, social integration, uh, inequality issues a lot. So yes, um, I think sociologists has their hands quite full and uh, we're engaged quite fully um, uh, in different parts of the, uh, of the com campus. Oh, also medical school and public health. It's another big collaborator too, as there's you know, sociology of health and aging and all this 
are moving into looking at health. Yeah, indeed. So I think one of the nice things, you know, being an economist and genes and sociologist is that I think um, many of the different social science fields within the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences really have overlapping topics from very different, possibly different angles of different methodologies. And I think, like you mentioned, the center is one, uh, uh, we have different centers and research institutes that kind of bring together scholars from uh, different um, fields where they could potentially work together and look for complementary um, kind of uh, research collaboration. So um, I think we've come to the end of this uh, very interesting session. So thank you again, Jean, for um, being with us this evening. And uh, um, um, thank you for sharing your, 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 your research and your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you.